Yes, yes. Let us thank and praise God for the privilege and the opportunity God has given us once again this morning to be in his presence, to learn from his precious word. I am Ajit Isaac in fellowship with the Christian Assembly Khadki Pune. And on behalf of the TERC team, I welcome all our dear brothers and sisters who have joined us from different parts of India. And we also welcome all our dear brothers and sisters from other countries who have joined in, in different time zones from US, Australia, South Africa, Middle East. And we especially welcome in our midst, our dear brother, Thomas Jacob, Seventh Lord from Kerala. And he is our teaching faculty for today's session on Christology. As uh, reminded last evening, uh, one of the branches of the systematic theology is Christology. And it uh, deals with the doctrine and the study of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, his deity and his humanity. And to put it simple, who the Lord Jesus Christ is, what he did and what it means. And it's very important for us to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to learn more about him, because our salvation directly depends on what we believe about Christ. So this morning, uh, let us commit our dear brother Thomas Jacob into the hands of the Lord as he'll be handling this subject. Today is the first class, and in the coming days, God would grant him the grace and guidance as he teaches us from the Word of God and uh, leads us into this subject. And let we commit all our dear ones who have joined this morning. And before I hand over the session, let us look to the Lord in the word of prayer. Almighty God, our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this wonderful privilege you have given us to be at your feet, to hear from your precious word, to learn more about the Lord. Father, we thank you for every spiritual blessing with which you have blessed us in the Lord Jesus Christ. The blessing of knowing thee, the blessing of knowing our Lord and Savior as revealed to us in the Holy Scriptures. And we thank you, Father, for this platform through TERC that we can have in a systematic study of thy word. Father, this morning we commit our dear brother Thomas Jacob into your loving hands, even as he takes this study on Christology. We pray, for Lord, for the needed grace and guidance, even as he expounds the scriptures to us. Father, how important for us to know the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious one, the one who existed from eternity past and who came down into this world as a man to know more about him in his sinless, impeccable life on earth his sacrificial death on the cross, his bodily resurrection, his ascension and exaltation at the right hand of God, and also his coming again in the future. Father, we pray that thou would help each one of us who have bowed their heads this morning in thy presence, that we would know more of our Lord Jesus Christ and we would grow in a more intimate personal relationship with our blessed Lord. And it is your desire, Lord, that we would grow more like the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. We would grow more in the likeness of our per the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray that thou would help us this even this morning. We thank you for the TERC team. We pray for all the dear brothers who are involved in this ministry. Thank you for granting grace to enable to have this ministry, Lord. It's only by your grace and guidance. We come at this meeting into your loving hands, giving the all glory, honor, and praise as this humble prayer in the most exalted name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I hand over this session to Brother Thomas Jacob. Thank you, Brother. Good morning, all of you. How blessed it is to 
have this time of fellowship this morning in the presence of God. As we are sitting in the presence of God and trying to understand the great uh, truth, one of the fundamental doctrines of our faith, which is Christology. We know that the word Christology is the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the study of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I have mentioned, during the inaugural function, we are going to look at the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the will of God in the days to come. As the children of God, we always believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. We knew about the glory and the majesty of our Lord, but it is always a great and a blessed thing to have a firm foundation for our faith uh, from uh, by looking to the scripture and understanding these truths from the word of God. We know that Jesus Christ is the central figure of God's plan. A few days ago, Brother Charlie John read from the book of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10, where we read like this, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So here we can see that Jesus Christ is the, is the central figure of God's plan. So God has put his son at the center of all the spiritual blessings that are needed for us. So let us look to the son and learn of him. As a way of introduction, I would like to uh, mention a few things uh, in the beginning. Uh, why we look to the Lord Jesus Christ and study the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. How important he is for us and also for the Father. We can gather from the scripture that he is the delight of the Father. He is the only one of its kind in the presence of God the Father. Often we, we read like this, that he is the only begotten son. Especially in John chapter 3 and verse 16, we have that phrase, the only begotten son. We all know that the word only begotten means the only one of its kind. And there is no one like Lord Jesus Christ. He is unique in the presence of God. He is the delight of God. And how great it is to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the unique in the presence of God, the only one of its kind in the presence of God. And we can see the affection that existed between God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter one and verse 18, there we read that the son who is in the bosom of the father. So Lord Jesus Christ is in the bosom of the father. He is so uh, dear to the father. And today as we sit in the presence of God, and as we, as we meditate upon the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ, let us also look to the Lord God and say that, oh God, we also consider Jesus Christ as the most important person in our lives. Not only that, Jesus Christ is the central figure of God's plan for us. Jesus Christ is the central figure of the world history. We know that history is his story. No one has impacted the life of man ever so much as this one perfect man. And we read that he can, uh, he, he, he impacted the life of people all over the time and all around the world. We can borrow the words of the Shulamite and say like this, my beloved is chiefest of 10,000 because he is the central figure of the world history. And also we can understand that the Christianity revolves around the person of Jesus Christ. There are a lot of religions in this world and all those religions have got their respective founders. 
but it is not an abiding principle that the followers of such religions should have a personal relationship with their founders. For example, in Buddhism, uh, it is not, this, uh, not uh, a necessity that the followers of Buddhism should have a personal relationship with Buddha. But when we come to Christianity, it is of utmost importance that those who are truly Christians should have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This can be said about many other religions that those personal relationship is not needed. But when we come to Christianity, there is no other choice unless and until one comes into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, he can be a true Christian or he can lead a true Christian life. And uh, it is well said like this, that the Christianity cannot exist without Christ. Christianity is Christ and Christ is Christianity. As I have mentioned uh, in that inaugural day, that the Christianity revolves around a person and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. And also we can understand from the scripture that Jesus Christ is a theme of all scripture. And when we, uh, uh, when we come to certain scripture portions, like John chapter 5 and verse 39, then Luke chapter 24 and verse 27, and other verses we can understand that how Christ is the theme of all scriptures. Uh, I, I just want to read one verse uh, in this connection, though we can quote various verses, and uh, I uh, already quoted two verses while uh, we had uh, that discussion on that uh, inaugural day uh, uh, from John chapter 5 and verse 39 and Luke chapter 24 and verse 27. Uh, also, we remembered on the first day about uh, Revelation chapter 19 and 10, where we have seen that Jesus Christ is the, uh, the spirit of Jesus Christ is the, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Today, I would like to read from Acts chapter 10 and uh, verse 43, where uh, we read again concerning the connection with the Lord Jesus Christ and the scripture. Acts chapter 10 and verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. We know that this is a portion uh, where we can read about the Peter's visit to the house of Cornelius. And there, as Peter was expounding the truths concerning the salvation and the Lord Jesus Christ to the people gathered over there. He is firmly assuring them that it is the theme of the scriptures that the Lord Jesus Christ would, should be believed by the people to get the redemption, to get the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus Christ is the theme of all scriptures. And uh, when we come to uh, Second John and the verses 9 to 11, uh, there we can see some reasons why uh, we have to give importance to this doctrine, Second John, chapter, uh, first, uh, sorry, uh, verses 9 to 11. There we read like this, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring unto uh, bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither uh, uh, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil uh, deeds. So here we have a beautiful explanation about the importance of the doctrine of Christ and how important it is for each and every believer to hold on to this doctrine. And not only that, we have to have fellowship only with such people who should uh, who are believing on this doctrine. So this doctrine of Christ is very vital for us. I was trying to explain some of the reasons why uh, this doctrine is important. Uh, Jesus Christ is the central figure of God's plan, and he is the delight of the Father. Jesus Christ is the central figure of uh, world history, 
and Christianity revolves around the person of Christ. And then Jesus Christ is the theme of all scriptures. And at last, uh, uh, how important it is to hold this doctrine, because that is the only way we can be connected to God the Father. And when we think of uh, this doctrine, Christology, we can understand that all the major aspects of this doctrine can be found in three important passages of the scripture. They are the first chapter of John and the first chapter of the Colossians, the epistles to the epistle to the Colossians, and also the first chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. These three chapters are filled with the truths of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, we can gather almost all important truths concerning the Lord Jesus Christ from these, uh, uh, from these three chapters. So uh, as we proceed, uh, let me uh, come to the first part of this doctrine. That is the person of Lord Jesus Christ. And in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have two different aspects to consider. First of all, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And secondly, the humanity of Lord Jesus Christ. The wonder of Lord Jesus Christ is this, that he is God and man in perfect union. God and man in one person. He existed from the past eternity, and in the due course of time, he came into this world and took upon himself the form of a man. And since then, we can look to him as God and man in one person. And this is a very, very, very wonderful thing, and a thing that is often difficult for people to understand. But by the grace of God, God has given us this great uh, favor to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to understand and to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, he is God, and also he is man. He is the true God, and he is the perfect man ever lived on the face of the earth. And this is a very difficult thing to understand. But it is the great truth upon which our faith resides. So as we consider the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, I would like to turn your attention to seven important truths concerning the Lord Jesus Christ deity. <coughs> we will be looking by uh, trusting on the Lord the following seven uh, important aspects in connection with the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The pre-existence of Christ, then the various divine names given to the Lord Jesus Christ, that the divine worship is ascribed to him, that divine qualities are possessed by him, and the divine attributes possessed by him, the divine offices ascribed to him, and how his name is coupled to that of the Father. These would be the seven uh, uh, headings upon which we would be meditating or and trying to understand the doctrine of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, trusting on the Lord, and shall we proceed and let us try to understand how uh, our Lord Jesus Christ is the true God, as revealed in the scripture. So, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, turn to that important uh, aspect, the first aspect, the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look to the scriptures, we can understand from both the Old Testament passage and the New Testament passages that this is a truth recorded in the scripture. 
by saying that the pre-existence of Christ, what we mean is Christ was existing even before his incarnation. And there are various kinds of understanding in this connection. There are some people who believe that Jesus Christ's existence started only from his birth. And there are people who think that Jesus Christ existed before his birth, but he was not the true God. But as we look to the word of God, and as we try to gather the truth from the word of God, it will be crystal clear before us that the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ is not only as a, a created being, but it is not, not as a created being, but as the creator of the universe, as the true God, he existed even before his incarnation. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to a couple of passages as we study uh, this, uh, this truth, the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as a way of introduction, I would like to uh, 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 bring to your notice two verses. And one is uh, from the book of Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 17, the first part of it, where we read like this, and he is before all things. Look to that verse. He is before all things. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17. It is not said that he was before all things. But the spirit of God clearly mentions that he is before all things. Look to that tense. He is present tense is used there. And he is, uh, uh, he is before all things. Uh, that means that all things were uh, uh, came into existence after the Lord Jesus Christ. He was before all the created beings. And when we come to the book of John, chapter 8 and verse 58, there we have the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ himself that says, that before Abraham was, I am. So our Lord has told us clearly that he was existent even before the days of Abraham. When Moses asked the Lord, what is your name in that burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, the Lord revealed his name to Moses. And the Lord said that, I am that I am. That is my name. You can go and tell your people that I am that I am has sent me. So the, what is the name of the God? In the Old Testament, God has revealed himself to Moses as I am. The one who is the ever existent I am. The one who was and who is and who is yet to come. So he is the one whose name is, I am that I am. And as the Lord was speaking to the Jews in John chapter 8, the verse which we have just referred, there we can see that the Lord is telling them that I am is standing before you. Jehovah is standing before you. Before Abraham was, Abraham was a, a, a person in the history, past history. But I am existed from the past till the future. So he expressed his deity in that very word. And they understood it. And so they took stones to cast upon him. They wanted to kill him because they could not digest this truth that Lord Jesus Christ was there from the past eternity. And he is the great God, the Jehovah, and he is standing before them. If they ex accept the pre-existence of Christ, then they must accept his deity. But for them, it was a very difficult thing to understand that the man who is standing before them is true God 
So they denied his pre-existence. They denied his deity. And uh, one of the Lord's servants mentioned like this, to deny the pre-existence of Christ is like removing sun from the sky. We know that we can understand all things or we look around and see and observe all things with the help of the sun, with the help of the light we get from the sun. And if we remove sun, then we will be in a third darkness. So if we take away this doctrine, the pre-existence of Christ, then we, can, we have to understand that, then we will be left in darkness. We cannot proceed further in any scriptural truth, in any scriptural aspect. So all those who accept the scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, they have to accept that Jesus Christ was existing even before his incarnation. And now let us come to the various passages from both the Old Testament and the New Testament that clearly tells us about the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And most of these passages are very familiar for us, but uh, we have to uh, go through these passages so that uh, we can be sure that how this truth is mentioned in the word of God. So first of all, let us come to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, and verses 1 to 4. Uh, Isaiah, chapter 6, and verses 1 to 4. And there we read like this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the force of the door moved of the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. This is a very uh, a familiar passage for us. And I would like you to notice some of the words used over here. In the first verse, we read like this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. Notice that what Lord mentioned over there is translated from the word Adonai, that means uh, the one who is having lordship over us. So here in the, uh, in the King James Version, only the capital letter is used for the first letter. The rest, it is the small letters, L-O-R-D, that only the L is capital. That speaks that the word uh, used over there is Adonai. So we read like this, <coughs> the day when King Uzziah died, Adonai was sitting on the high and the lifted up throne. And we can see that how the heavenly beings, they were worshipping him. The one who is sitting on the throne, the Adonai. And again, as we come to verse 3, we read that as they worship, there they are using the phrase, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. There in KJV, you can see that all the letters of that word Lord is in uh, capital letters. That means that it is not Adonai, but it is the word Yahweh, Yehovah. The word Jehovah is used there. So the one who is sitting on the throne, that is the Adonai, and he is the Jehovah there. So that speaks of an instance of Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how can we understand that this is about 
the Lord Jesus Christ himself that we can learn from uh, the book of John and chapter 12 and verse 41 where uh, we read uh, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ like this. Uh, These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. So here we are reading about the Lord Jesus Christ as John the beloved is describing about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is saying that he saw Isaiah was speaking about the same Lord Jesus Christ and he was looking to his glory and wrote those words. So that is a clear reference that our Lord Jesus Christ was existing even before his incarnation. Not only that he existed, he existed, but that means that he is the God, he is Yehovah, and the one who is worthy to be worshipped. So that is one passage that clearly tells us about the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again in the book of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, we read like this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Here again, we can see various titles given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we understand these uh, titles, we have to notice two important facts here. Here we are, uh, we are brought to meditate upon a person. And that person is mentioned as a child that is born. And again, we read that it is a son who is given. So the child that was born was a son that was given. And that phrase given is often used in uh, the Gospel of John. We read that word that the Lord Jesus Christ was given by God the Father. That means that he is given by God. That is, he was existing before he was given. He was existing in heaven. So the son is given. And again, look to the titles of that son. We read various words. I am not going to describe all of them. But we have a word that he is the everlasting father. Uh, That is what we read in verse 6. He is the everlasting father. Say the son is the everlasting father. The son is called as the everlasting father here. And we are told by the scholars that the word everlasting father can be rightly translated as he is the father of eternities. If Lord Jesus Christ is the father of eternities, we can understand that the Lord Jesus Christ was existing even before, even before his incarnation, even before the creation of the world, because eternities came from him. And he was there from the past eternity. So Isaiah chapter 9 and 6 again clearly tells us about the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another prophetic passage we can see is Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. There we read about the Lord Jesus Christ. And there we read about his birth, that he would be born in the Bethlehem, uh, uh, Bethlehem Ephratha. And this particular passage <coughs> was quoted by the scribes during the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, when the Magi came to visit uh, the King Herod in Matthew chapter 2. So let us turn to Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, where we read like this. But thou Bethlehem Ephratha, though uh, thou be little among the thousands of Judah, 
yet out of thee shall be come, shall he come forth unto me, that is also, the, uh, that is to be ruler in the Israel, whose going, goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So here we have a verse that speaks about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this verse, we are told that the person who is going to be born in Bethlehem, his goings forth are from everlasting. His, his goings forth are from old. That speaks about the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are looking to the Old Testament passages where we can see that it is clearly mentioned how our Lord existed even before his incarnation, even before coming to this world. And we have a lot of New Testament passages also that brings before us this great truth. So let us now uh, look to some New Testament passages and uh, let us understand how this truth is very clearly engraved in the uh, in the pages of the scripture, and we have no uh, difficulty to understand and to believe it. So first of all, let us come to John chapter 1 and verse 1. <coughs> In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John chapter 1 and verse 1. We all might have uh, learned this verse by heart, Maybe during our Sunday school days. So we read that in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Now, what is the meaning of this verse? If we want to understand the meaning of this verse, we have to connect this verse with verse 14 of the same chapter. Where we read that and the word was made flesh. Or the word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we can get a clear understanding that the word mentioned in the first verse is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who took upon himself the form of a man, who came into this world uh, as a man, who incarnated. So we can understand that the verse, first verse is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have three important truths mentioned in that very first verse. We are told that in the beginning was the word that speaks of the eternality of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was eternally existing. That word was eternally existing. Then we read like this, and the word was with God <coughs> that speaks of the distinct personality of that word that says that this word was uh, uh, was a person. So this pers this uh, word was eternally existing. That is the meaning of that first uh, phrase. And the second phrase says that, and the word was with God that speaks of the distinct personality of that word. And thirdly, we read that, and the word was God. That speaks of the deity of that word. And when we come to verse 14, we can understand that the same word who was eternally existing, who had a distinct personality, and who is God himself, came into this world in the form of a man, filled with grace and truth. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So John chapter 1 and verse 1 is a clear indication of the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we can notice that word in the beginning. And the beginning here mentioned is from eternity. It is from eternity. We all know that the Bible begins that uh, word. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There, the word beginning is referring to the beginning of the creation. Whereas in John chapter 1, the beginning is referring to the past eternity. So we can understand that 
our Lord Jesus Christ was in eternal past and he is indefinable to the human wisdom because he is beyond the reach of time. And as we consider this verse, we can compare this verse with another passage in the New Testament that is Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. Again, a passage which we are familiar and there we can uh, look to that two particular phrases over there who being in the form of God. Who being in the form of God. What is the meaning of that? That speaks of the eternal existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have another phrase. Uh, he, uh, he did not think that he should be equal with God. That speaks of his distinct personality. And in the following verses, we know that it is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, these two aspects are mentioned in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. His eternal existence and also his distinct personality. Now, let us come to the second passage uh, in the New Testament where we can uh, look to the pre-existence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in the book of John and chapter 1 and verse 30. Uh, this verse can find its uh, uh, connection verse 15 also, but we will read from verse 30. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. This is mentioned by John the Baptist concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. In the first part, it is the author of the book, John the Beloved, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote those words. But here, this is the testimony of John the Baptist. And he is saying that the Lord Jesus Christ, he was he comes after me that speaks of his uh, uh, the, 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 that chronological order we all know that john the baptist <coughs> was born 6 months before the lord jesus christ so he could say that uh, uh, here a man cometh after me so according to the chronological perspective Lord Jesus Christ was after John the Baptist. But in the eternal perspective, we can say that the Lord, uh, John the Baptist could say that he was before me. So John is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ and he is telling the people that this one who is coming after me was in fact there even before me. How can this be possible? Because this is the Lord Jesus Christ who was eternally, he was eternally existing. Now, another phrase that we have to consider when we study the book of John, the gospel of John, and that word is the word send. Often we have that verse mentioned uh, in various parts of the, this gospel that God sent his son. Uh, for example, we can uh, read from John chapter 3 and verse uh, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. See that word, God sent his son. Again, in another portion, uh, so I'm reading just only a couple of verses, but we can look to some other passages as well. Uh, John chapter 6 and verse 38, there again we have the same phrase mentioned over there. Uh, I, for I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So, Lord Jesus Christ is saying that I was sent by the Lord. Or it is mentioned concerning Jesus Christ that he is sent by God the Father. Now, we know that someone can be sent only if he was existing before that action. So, if 
by the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was sent into this world by God the Father. That means that he was existing before that. He was existing before his birth. So the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ is clearly mentioned in various passages with this phrase, send, as mentioned in the Gospel of John. Apostle Paul is also using the similar phrase, phrase uh, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. There we <laughs> read like this, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. God sent forth his son. So how clear it is that this word uh, God sent forth says that he was existing before being sent. While I was studying in uh, my college, I remember one person came over there and he was trying to uh, trying to teach a doctrine uh, uh, called uh, uh, doctrine uh, that says that Jesus Christ became the Son of God only after uh, his thirty years of sinless life. So uh, myself and uh, some of the uh, uh, students from the assembly uh, they uh, uh, showed this verse to. The, uh, the students and told them that how clearly it is written that John, Lord Jesus Christ did not become a son after uh, he lived a sinful life, but he was sent forth by God because he was the son of God in the past eternity. So here we are not looking to the sonship primarily, but his existence in the eternity, past eternity. So uh, I would like to quote that verse and say that how clearly Apostle Paul is also uh, supporting this truth that God has sent forth his son. That means the son was there even before he was sent into this world. When we come to John chapter 17 and verse 5, we can see the high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. How our Lord was praying to God the Father. He was praying for various things. And the primary thing, he was praying for himself. And as he was praying for himself, John chapter 17 and verse 5, we read that he was praying like this, uh, that the glory which he had before God the Father, before the world was, he wanted to be glorified with that glory. John chapter 17 and verse 5, the glory he had, before the world was. So that means even before coming into this world, even before the worlds were created, he was in the glory. He had the glory. And concerning that glory, we can also read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9 that the rich became poor. The one who was rich in glory became poor in time as he came into this world. The, the word rich over there is again a reference to the glory he had during his pre-existence, during the time he was with the Father before coming into this world. So John chapter 17 and verse 5 is again another clear verse that mentions before us how the Lord Jesus Christ was existing even before his incarnation, the pre-existent glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'd like to turn your attention to uh, one or two passages from the book of Hebrews. And uh, as I have mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter one is full of the glories of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we, <coughs> when we come to the verse three, Hebrews chapter one and verse three, we read like this, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So here we are told about the Lord Jesus Christ. Various truths are mentioned in that first 
few verses, but we are going to concentrate on two particular phrases there. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. The Lord Jesus Christ is mentioned as the brightness of the glory of God. That word brightness can be uh, said like this, as the effulgence of the glory of God. Lord Jesus Christ was the effulgence of the glory of God, the brightness of his glory. What is the meaning of that word? That means that he was the radiance of the glory of God. Think of the sun that is in the sky. Can we remove the radiance, the brightness of the sun? And how can we think again about that sun? It would be dark and we have nothing to do with that. So we read that as the radiance is important for the sun, is important for the sun. So the brightness of the glory of God is so important for God. And as we cannot separate the radiance of the sun and the sun, so we cannot separate the brightness of the glory of God and the glory of God. So Lord Jesus Christ what exists, was existing since the God the Father was existing. That means that Lord Jesus Christ was ever existent with the Father. Again, a clear reference to the pre-existing glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then again, let us come to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5. And there we read a, a verse concerning his uh, incarnation. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifices and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Here we have a dialogue between God the Father and the Son uh, 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 in, in heaven. So there our Lord is saying to the Father that a body thou hast prepared for me. And at that moment, Christ has not received that body or he did not come into this world uh, in the, in, in, as a man. So before coming into the world, he is talking to the Father and he's saying that, a body thou hast prepared for me. That means that Lord Jesus Christ was existing even, even before his body was prepared. We know the story of Abraham, sorry, Adam. Adam was brought into existence a while after his body was prepared. Initially, the body was prepared, and then God the Father, he made him a living soul by breathing into his nostrils. So the body was there first, and then Adam came into existence. But when we think of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ was existing even before his body was prepared. So again, another clear reference to the pre-existent glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, uh, I would like to turn your attention to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1 and verse 4, and to compare again that verse with Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 11, there we can see that Christ was present when eternal purposes were made. I'm not going to read that verse, but uh, we uh, let us uh, note that verse Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4 and verse 3 and 11. From these two verses, we can understand that our Lord Jesus Christ, he <coughs> was present in the eternal counsels of God. So if he was present in the counsels of God in the eternity, he was truly existing before his incarnation. So as we are meditating upon the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, the pre-existence of Christ has to be considered. And we have a lot of scripture portions to support this great truth. So without any doubt, let us all believe with a whole heart and let us thank God that the Lord Jesus Christ, who was ever existent with God the Father, was sent to this world 
given to us as a gift and it was for our salvation so that we might be reconciled to god the father so let us thank him and let us worship him let us greatly adore his name his name be 